Hello, good morning, good evening, and welcome to the third edition of our three expert talks in the context of Emerging International Voices, a program that the Goethe Institute is conducting together with IFLA. My name is Brigitte Dölgast. I'm the head of the library department at the Goethe Institute in Munich. The Goethe Institute, as you may know by now, is the cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany with a global reach. We promote knowledge of German language and abroad and foster international cultural cooperation. We have 157 institutes in 97 countries and 96 of these institutes also have a library. We started the series two weeks ago with the topic digitalized libraries, why, what, how. Participants explore the different ways in which digital tools can enhance existing library services as well as making it possible to offer new ones. The focus was put on the process of creating digital libraries. How can we make sure that we create platforms that suit the user's needs? Last week, we continued by focusing on the question from a physical to a virtual community space. What is possible? We heard from Katrin Schuster of the Munich City Library and Luke Svartut from the New York Public Library about the many ways libraries interact with their audience also in a digital space. Inform, discover, participate. This is a motto that works in a physical and digital environment. For our final session, we talk about competitors, comparators, complements, digital libraries and internet giants. The rise of the internet and the rise of a few major players within the internet was seen always as a threat, but also as an opportunity for libraries. We are excited to hear the input and the discussion about this important issue. And for this, I hand over to Gerald Leitner, Secretary General of IFLA, who will act as a moderator. Thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Brigitte, for your introduction and for all the Goethe Institute does for libraries globally. And it's always great to be able to work with you. Many thanks to the Goethe Institute and especially to Brigitte and your team. As Brigitte mentioned, this is of course the third in our series. And it has been great to have joined you over the last two weeks in listening to the great speakers who have already presented. At a time that there are so many other things competing for our intention, uh, I know it isn't always easy to take the time to listen, to engage with new ideas and viewpoints. There's so much going on, so much information coming at us, so many choices to make. Yet it's for this reason that these opportunities are so valuable, indeed more valuable than ever precisely because all that we are facing. As underlined in our first webinar, we need good ideas and since no one has a monopoly, we have much to gain from sharing. The subject of competition for attentions is in fact a particularly relevant one for this week's session. As more and more of our lives, of our jobs, of our interactions move online, the potential for gathering information about us increases. Previously, information about our preferences, the book we read, the food we ate, the people we talked to was kept. The idea of collecting this, analyzing it, using it to target advertising existed only in the imagination. Now this is possible and fortunes have been built by doing precisely this, at least in a small number of companies, major internet platforms. For these companies, our attention is valuable because it yields data which can in turn be used to produce new marketable insights. Clearly, these developments raises questions and governments are beginning to act. In the last few days even, the, U the US competition authorities have begun to investigate Google. At the same time, it is undeniable that these platforms do provide useful services and simply calling for their disappearance or wishing them away is unlikely to achieve much. Partially because they do appear to be here to stay at least for the foreseeable future, partially because they may even offer opportunities for libraries to show their own value. So we face important questions. How can we hope to compete in an intention economy? 
what can we offer in contrast to or as a complement to the activists of these platforms? We are against bold with our speakers today, and I'm pleased to introduce two excellent, two outstanding speakers today. But first, I wanted to hand over to Stephen for an introductory question to all of you. Stephen, please go on. Thank you, Gerald, for the floor. So, as we've been doing in recent weeks, we're keen to start these sessions by actually engaging you and seeking your views on a question related to the subject. So this week is no different at all. So I'm going to get the poll up on the screen. And the question for you is this time, how confident do you feel in explaining the value of libraries in comparison with internet platforms such as YouTube or Amazon? And in this 10 means totally confident and one means not confident at all. Okay, great, the votes are coming in. Up to 50, doing well. I can tell you now that the people who tune into these webinars are optimists in general. This is a positive sign. Let's give it another five seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. And I'm going to share the results so that you can see these on your screen. Once again, I think this is not far from the results of the question last week. So most people seem to be pretty confident. The highest scoring sum is eight. So that that would apply, imply that people are pretty sure of themselves and explain the value of libraries. And then we have a cluster between five and nine. Very few people don't feel confident. So that's like, it's a positive thing to start with. We have people who are optimists. And um, I should add very quickly before handing back to Gerald, we'll be asking this question again at the end. But of course, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to use the Q&A button that you will see at the bottom of the screen. And you will see in this the option to vote for the questions that you find the most interesting, and that will help us later. But now back to Gerald. Thank you, Stephen. And now I have really the pleasure to introduce our first speaker. And as said before, she's an excellent one. Marie Östergaard is the director of the famous Aarhus Public Libraries. She has been focused on the question of how to create the library of the future for almost 20 years with a focus on interactions user involvements, network development, prototyping, and communication in the physical library space, and to combine it with the virtual one. And what I really admire in her work is that always when she's talking about libraries, the people are in the center of her mind. She was the project leader of the building of the award-winning new central public library for Aarhus Doc One implementing and developing ideas, as well as introducing new forms of collaborations with users in the planning and building process, which was quite new and very important. She has also committed to encouraging and supporting the development of future library leaders around the world, including through her participation here today. Many thanks, Marie, that you join us and please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for this beautiful presentation, Geld. I'm quite honored to be here. Um, and I'm um, also very happy that uh, to be able to speak to you guys, because I think this is just an introduction. Is it, as you said, this is a, a great time for us to, uh, to join forces and, and share the knowledge more easily even than we usually did before. So what I'm going to try and do is uh, to share my screen. Right now, I see Gerald which I always love to see Gerald, but, <laughs> but uh, hopefully in two seconds, I can share my screen and then um, you guys will, I'll take you on a very quick journey through um, some of the things that I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, and so I'm just gonna, yeah. Do you see it now? Yes, excellent. So I wanted to, I know the topic is the digital community and so you're probably going to be a bit surprised with how I want to start but I, I I exactly want to do this point that the public library is both a digital and a physical community um, so I want to start taking you through very quick points on where I believe a library is whether being physical or digital um, I'll take you through how we're working with uh, uh, uniting the libraries in a digital arena to be part of the whole digital um, world and then how we see different mixes of uh, public libraries using both the physical and digital world 
especially after this um, training period of lockdowns that we all experienced. So just to give you a, a view of where I'm coming from. So for us, the public library uh, is about, it's a place, it's space, and it's about relations. And everything that we do and whatever platform we're using, phys physical or digital, we need to take care of each of these three things. So that's, that's sort of in the core of who we are and what we believe in. We also believe that a library needs to be a mashup, a mashup of a, of a, a thousand different things with a thousand different partners coming in on the digital or physical platform, working with us to provide the best possible service towards the public. So it's not, we're not an island. We're not the only ones owning library spaces, neither the physical nor the, nor the digital. It's something that we do together with the community and the different partners and citizens who, who want to be involved. That is super important for us. So as Joel said, we always have the people and, and, and the community as the organizing factor of everything that we do. And that's what I believe libraries should be doing and, and uh, no matter what kind of platform we're working with. And we need to work with co-creation in all platforms. We've been working heavily for many years on, on uh, design thinking. We got a big grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to uh, uh, create a design thinking toolkit for libraries uh, together with the Chicago Public Libraries. And we, we are traveling around the world to teach other libraries how to use design thinking in their development of services towards the, the public. Um, so that's also how we approach things. When we talk about a physical library, I'm, I'm just going to show you a few pictures from Doc One uh, in Aarhus. But we we really sincerely believe that a library should be open, non-programmed spaces that people can come in and use and occupy and do what they believe are the most important things um, for the for themselves in the library. So very often the library looks like this because this is what people need at that exact moment. Different, many types of different activities that demands different types of spaces. Um, we also believe that uh, the library should be a place where you uh, encounter um, debates, where you encounter democracy, where you participate in democracy, where you work together, and where you encounter cultural activities and you participate in them. So we drag everything out in the open so everybody can stumble upon it. We believe the libraries need to engage um, the users. So we have a lot of user-driven activities in the libraries. It is not the library that drives it. We give the space to others that come in and then do services for other citizens. And uh, not least, we believe that play is a super important issue of a library, not just play for kids, as you can see in the pictures, but also for adults, uh, because play is a big part of who we are and um, how we work together and what kind of communities we form. And play is also culture. So for us, play is extremely important as well. So, so this is the the sort of um, overview of what, what we think a library should be. So what has, what has happened in, in Denmark is that we've actually worked over many years together with the physical library on creating uh, an open platform, open source um, digital community uh, on a national level. So now we created an a national association of a digital public library, which basically means that all municipalities in Denmark have uh, joint forces uh, and have created this association where we um, have connect, uh, created a connected library, the digital public library for all citizens in Denmark. Um, it's a formal association, so it's the library directors of uh, the Danish libraries that owns this, so to speak. And that has been a major step for us in terms of making sure that we're giving the best digital services to um, the communities that we serve. So this um, association, we run a joint library um, CMS. That, that means that all our um, the libraries' um, the websites are based on the same CMS, which you can customize to fit your own library. But it means that not every library has to have the competences to actually work with this. It's something that we run together. It means that we've created a, a joint library app, so you can access the library from your phone, wherever you are. You can have all the same um, possibilities that you can on a website. It's a very, very popular feature. You can book, reserve, you can uh, check your loans, et cetera, and also search the entire catalog and other services and library from your phone, from home, or in the library if you want to. We also run uh, the digital um, uh, e-book e le um, lending platform in, in Denmark. So 
the libraries with Aarhus uh, in front, together with Copenhagen, created the very first version of this that is called the e-shelf. So it's basically uh, um, lending of digital books for free for everybody. Uh, and that's also become now a national part of this association so that wherever you are in, in Denmark, you have access to the library catalog on ebooks for free. Um, which is of course something that a lot of um, more commercial actors are very curious about. At some point they, um, they decided to withdraw all the licenses for, um, for some of the materials on the e-shelf um, because they thought they were gonna, they were gonna create their own platform um, in a more commercial manner. But what happened was that nobody, it, they found out how, how difficult this is and they came back into the e shelf and now we are dealing with all the uh, different publishing houses again, because this is how in Denmark the rise of uh, e-lending actually began. It was through the library's um, e-book shelf. So we run that as well as a national thing. We run uh, the what's called literature site, which is more um, the um, you can say the communication about literature. It's a lot of articles. It's a lot of inspiration. It's a lot of interview with authors. Also, an inter uh, a national um, joint service that we run together as libraries. And and when I say run together, it's not just the association running it. It's basically every library that puts in different uh, qualifications, and um, and it becomes a, a joint source for um, all the qualifications that we have in libraries and that comes up on this website. So this association runs, so these are just some of the major things that we run together. We also uh, do joint license negotiation. We have this cover service. So you guys know that when you wanna um, show uh, front covers of books on, online. There's also a lot, always a lot of discussions with the publishers. This is de dealt with nationally, one place. We create library statistics and data for all the libraries um, in, in all Denmark to use in their communication and advocacy. Uh, we've managed to create a single sign-on to all digital services so that the public has a better approach to everything that we do. And again, we joined forces on creating what's called a library produced content, which means that you can have one library who's very good at producing, for instance, articles about films. They put it into this shared platform and other libraries can draw from it. And that goes for all libraries. So it's become a massive pool of knowledge from specialists all around Denmark. So for us, this has been an extremely important thing. And it's quite uncommon also in a Danish context to give power over public money to uh, a, a profession such as library directors or libraries. But because libraries are so, so has such a strong um, brand and libraries are very um, trustworthy, it has been um, decided by the municipalities, by the government that this is the way to go. And because they can see that libraries are actually capable of doing this when we join forces, right? So, so you, I took you through the physical library, I'm taking you through the association part, which is the digital. So what I believe that I wanted to, to end up with was talking about the library mix. So what is that? What is the mix between these two? And for us also in the light of COVID and lockdowns, et cetera, we have been looking at what is what are the specific things that libraries need to do? We need to look at relations. We're the only ones who do that. We need to look at intimacy. Uh, digital community building, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and we need to use all platforms. So we've been going through like libraries all over the world, uh, online knitting clubs, uh, doing poetry. You can write poetry together online and you can add music to it. So we did a lot of sessions in that. Book talks from the living room, pen pals for lonely people. How do you reach the, the young, lonely, vulnerable people during times of lockdown? Um, how do you use Minecraft? to work with people who have dif different difficulties. How do we reach some of the uh, more vulnerable people in our society during times of um, pandemics? Uh, Ebook services where we use our digital services and reach directly into the nursing homes. We try to showcase our partnerships on, uh, this is on Facebook where we did partnership co uh, communications and dialogues throughout these lockdown months. And we're gonna continue doing it even though we're open again because this is also a way of showing the world what libraries and partners can do together. We even managed to do design thinking online. Not, a, not an easy task, I have to add, but, but it worked. Um, and we are now walk, walk, 
looking into this uh, myriad of things where we can see that we need to uh, connect the, the more digital scale formats with live formats. Uh, we need to look at some of the vulnerable uh, parts of our society because nobody else does that. And how can we do that both digitally and physical? We need to always create different layers in our activities. And we need to use our outside spaces much more. Um, one, one of the things that I just want to mention that we found um, during this time um, is the immense lack of democratic spaces. And I think that libraries are some of the only places in our society that can do the, this in a trustworthy um, way. So we're now combining our digital versions of a library with the physical work versions of library in strengthening these democratic debates about what happens in our society. So that was the very, very quick uh, run through uh, of a lot of different things that I think we need to look at when we look at libraries in a digital uh, context. Right. So thank you. Th thank you so much, Marie. This was fantastic. I guess the presentation as well as your all the inspirations which you gave us with your with your talk. And I guess there will be a lot of questions after our second speaker I'll come to you, Marie. Many thanks. It was really great. So, and now I have really the pleasure to uh, introduce my neighbor uh, of the Royal Library in uh, the Netherlands. Usually we are sitting more or less through. Uh, yeah, we are at the same floor in, in the national libraries. We are neighbors and I have really the great pleasure uh, to introduce now Harry Favain, the executive, di executive, executive uh, director of the European Foundation. Harry has been with Europeana for even 10 years now and over two years in his current role. In this, he leads the foundation's work to support heritage institutions in Europe to make the best of the digital transformation and at the same time, bring their collections to the widest possible audiences, in particular through the Europeana platform. His previous work has seen him focus both on new business models for heritage institutions and working in the academic publishing industry. With all this experience, both of developing a, con a continental digital library and supporting institutions in their own work, I'm looking forward to hearing more from Harry on today's questions. Harry, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Gerald. And um, thank you for those kind words. And it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to speak to you and, um, and all the people uh, on the call. I think I read 160 uh, or so, that's, that's amazing. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Um, and you should now see the blue slide. Is that yes? Okay, great. So um, I was very pleased with the topic also of today. Um, I've relabeled that for myself as the relationship between public spaces, uh, digital libraries in particular, but public spaces in general, and let's call them big tech. Um, and how can we how can we shape that relationship in a way that is a bit more wholesome than uh, perhaps what we've been confronted with uh, recently? So I'm labeling this a exploration talk. It's uh, a new thing. I'm not going to pretend that I have all the answers for you. Um, it's one of the topics that has recently come up um, together with topics like diversity and inclusion uh, that we've that we've recognized at Europeana as, as very important and urgent topics to start formulating an opinion on. And uh, I will be uh, interacting with you. I will be having two Mentimeter slides uh, with a poll. So if you have another device, uh, a phone of some sort, so please keep it at hand or use one of your browser tabs um, so I can, I can really test what the temperature of the water is on some topics. Final note, uh, this is going to be a, a fairly European-centered uh, presentation. Uh, that's the nature of my game, but of course, I hope that this is something that resonates much more widely uh, in your community and all your worldwide organization. So. Uh, I hope that works. So I'd like to start with a, a short example uh, that puts me to think. 
um, and that I'm also within the European Foundation and testing out what people feel about it. So the example is uh, this man. Uh, this is Adam Kozari. He's the social media manager at the Royal Academy in London. And he's become quite famous uh, recently on, on social media. So what has he done? Um, on March 18, so that was days after the lockdown in the UK, and I think the lockdown uh, quite generally across Europe, he came up with quite a brilliant social media strategy uh, based on a very simple question. He doesn't even have a question mark, but this is what he asked on Twitter. Who can draw us the best hand? So that might be a quite a trivial question, um, but it resonated. Uh, so within hours, the Royal Academy's Twitter account was flooded with the most incredible works of art, uh, professional, non-professional. Here you see a, an Art Nouveau styled ham. Um, we've seen very nice miniatures here, a ham on watercolor. Um, and here you also see um, a bit of a cartoon. It's a, it's a person shaped as a ham slouched over his laptop in a Corona homeworking environment setting. So we've seen really the breadth of creativity uh, coming up in this, in this uh, campaign. Now, as you can see, uh, all of these works received an immense amount of likes, 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 wasn't um, out of the ordinary. And you have to realize that the Royal Academy was a relatively unknown player in social media uh, recently. So in a New York Times article, um, Adam was asked, you know, uh, how, how, do you, how do you explain the success? And uh, he said, well, what we thought, our team thought, was that people really seemed to want uh, some light relief from the news. And we were able to pick up on that quite quickly. And uh, yeah, we're, we're very happy with those results. Um, so I'd like to now invite you to go to menti.com and you should see a screen uh, with three possible answers. And I'm gonna ask you, do you think this is a, a good example of success of a public institution uh, in times of COVID on digital? And you can say, yes, uh, that's, that's a great example. You can say, no, not a good example. You might also think, um, have a little bit of mixed feelings about it. And of course, we'd like to investigate that a bit more. But a lot of you seem to think this is a great example of success. He indeed tripled the uh, amount of followers of the Royal Academy, Academy in weeks. Uh, up to half a million. Now, I think many of you will be very jealous of having that kind of following on social media. Um, I'm gonna wait a little bit. I see the yeses climbing faster than the noes. There's one person who is not as positive about this. Um, and some of you who have mixed feelings about this. All right. I think by the way, this is one of the great examples of digital that we're, we're able to interact so well uh, through these type of things, through chats, through Q&As. All right, so I think uh, a pattern starts to evolve. Most of you think by a large majority, this is a great example of success. Um, second runner up is mixed feelings and only one person thinks this is not a success at all. All right, I'm going to... Um, I see that we have 50 people participating. Thank you very much. Uh, please keep your phone in hand. Uh, we're going to have one more question at the end of my presentation. So let's go back to here. All right. So I think the, to me, the answer is mixed. I think uh, Adam Kozari would made incredible good use of the media at his disposal. He's clearly very brilliant. He was actually, which is a nice side story, picked up by, uh, handpicked by Elon Musk of Tesla to join his company's uh, social media team, which only worked for uh, a very, very short period of time. Adam wasn't happy there and rejoined the <laughs> Royal Academy quite soon. Um, I think this was a brilliant example of a good, well executed social media campaign, but it also poses some questions. Um, 
this only happened on Twitter, which is a very commercial platform run by the United States, and we don't have really public alternatives in, in our own countries. I think we've seen uh, some of these examples uh, very early on in the, in the pandemic. Uh, what I'm showing you now is that a NEMO report, which is a museum's associations in Europe, uh, reported 60% increase of online activity of their museums uh, during the pandemic. This was by the end of June. But the month after also showed us that uh, a couple of things. One is it were only the most, the biggest and the largest and the best equipped museums who were online. And also when you look at it uh, a little bit more in depth, uh, it was either for fun, it was social media, or it was what Adam uh, also warned us for in the New York, uh, um, New York Times article. Uh, most of these people will be going to fall into the trap of just trying to replicate what they did in the physical environment in an online environment and using big commercial platforms to do it. So um, let's explore our problem space a little bit. Um, I've been doing some investigations with my teams and the network of Europeana, which is uh, also a couple of thousand people large, and three very prevalent problems with the big commercial platforms started to emerge. Now, before I get there, uh, this is an interesting number that I'd like to show you as well. About one quarter, or actually a third of all the world population uses Facebook on a monthly basis. About two thirds actually have access to Facebook and have a subscription. Now that tells you that in terms of reach, these, this is not something that is in any way negligible. But it also means that uh, these big five, top five companies are monopolizing the internet. Uh, and they're largely non-EU corporations, which is not your concern perhaps, but I think for the European Union is, because it also leads to a loss of sovereign oversight of our digital space and therefore also the economy. And I think the, the cultural and creative economy is starting to be recognized as a very significant force in Europe. We have about, we contribute to about 4% of the GDP and 9 million people have employment in this space. So that would be the biggest problem, number one. The second one is a deterioration of online public debate due to the increase of misinformation and reinforcement of filter bubbles. Now, we've all read a lot about that. I think the reinforcement of filter bubbles is the thing that would concern me most. I think algorithms that are designed by what is unquestionably the best technology people in the world from these big platforms are only designed to make us get more of the things we already like. And I think one of the roles of public libraries and libraries in general is to really show us the breadth of information that is at our disposal, the variety and the diversity. And I think that's a huge problem that public libraries can, can play a role in. And the third one is a lack of EU-based digital development and service delivery leading to a loss of innovation and therefore of opportunities for social and economic development, and this is the important part, in line with European values. Now, I think as Gerald already mentioned, uh, these European values are being recognized more and more in the international uh, space. Uh, these are being adopted, things like GDPR, privacy issues, and so forth. I think regulations start to become, regulations, protocols, frameworks start to become an export product for Europe. And I think libraries have an important role to play there. So what I'd like to do in the coming months is really explore our options. And uh, I'd like to just very quickly bring you back to uh, how Europeana got started. And some of you may recognize this person here, Jean-Noël Janemay, uh, who was uh, in the early 2000s, the um, head librarian of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, the, the National Library of France. And he by himself, and with uh, many of you, I'm sure, in this community, took a stance and a very important stance. So this was at the time when Google came in and said, you don't have a problem with digital. We're gonna just digitize your whole library. You're gonna get a copy of it. And the only thing is that it will be available through Google search interfaces only. And Janine and uh, uh, his competitors brought that up to a national and international level. So a couple of heads of state then started what later would become the Europeana Initiative and not only the Europeana Initiative, but many, a, a thought pattern about how we should 
look and deal with what, what we call our public uh, public space. So the public domain, the fact that cultural heritage should really belong to all of us and what that means in a digital environment. So to make a long story short, uh, Europeana over the past 10 years has been a little bit obsessed with uh, making sure that uh, the digitized material not only becomes available, but becomes available with certain conditions so that we're very specific about uh, the copyright uh, of these works, about the quality of these works, and uh, we're, we're developing all kinds of frameworks and protocols to make sure that the, the owners of the works and the makers are being recognized in the process, and as much material becomes available under very clear conditions. So we now have 50 million uh, items on Europeana, um, but the important part is that almost half of that is now uh, available under no additional conditions, which means it's in the public domain, it's clearly labeled to be in the public domain. And that's, I think, how we as libraries can make a difference in the public space, because we're very clearly indicated what can and what cannot be done with the material we make available. Um, a little bit more, two thirds uh, or, uh, of all the material is available uh, under some kinds of reuse. So Creative Commons is a party that we work with uh, for a long time. And that means that we'll be able through our networked activities to provide options. Uh, we're democratizing access to culture, uh, which means that as a library, if you follow these, then you are able to work with many platforms. You could work it on Twitter, you can put it on Wikimedia, you can put it on public platforms as well as commercial. And I think when we start talking about, you know, what do we do in a, in a place that is dominated by large commercial players and we still want to provide alternatives, is I think we can build that into our internal, internal frameworks. Perhaps when we put videos online, we do use YouTube because that's where we find reach, but we make sure that we also put it on Vimeo. And similarly, uh, we put things on Twitter, but also on Wikimedia. And perhaps that's a way of providing options for the people that we serve. So I'd like to now bring you to my final Mentimeter question. Um, so if you'd so kind to whip out your phone again. And uh, I'm going to ask you just point blank. Do you think that it is possible to have a public alternative? Is that a viable option? And again, I gave you three options because three is a magic number and you can say yes, no, or well, that really depends. And again, I see you're an incredibly positive crowd. Yes, it's absolutely possible to have a public alternative. We've doubled the amount of no's from the previous question. Uh, two people really don't think we have a viable option. And 11, and this is climbing, would say it depends. And I think that pattern is sustained in this mentee. So I see again 50 people or so, about half of you have responded. Thank you so much. This really gives me more input to, to work with and I'll be happy to further this discussion. Uh, if you wanna have my opinion, I would say it depends. I do think it's possible to provide alternatives, but I think it's really important that we think through how we do this um, because it's, it's broader than just reach. It's also about accessibility and diversity and all those type of things. So thank you very much. Um, if I may, Gerald, I'm gonna make a little bit of promotion for ourselves. We've got a conference coming up on the 11th 12th and 13th of November that I invite you to also join. It's free and we're going to continue this type of a discussion uh, on the theme of crisis, change and culture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry, so much. Uh, I guess there will be a lot of questions coming up to you and I hand over now to uh, Stephen Weiber to continue. Or, or, or even to Gosha, I'm going to hand over to Gosha from the Goethe Institute. <laughs> Hi, so Stephen and I are going to be moderating the questions, the two of us, and we would like to ask of the most popular question um, by Alana. Uh, Alana, we turn on your microphone. Would you like to ask the question yourself? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So my question is, in the Philippines, we, have, we are very limited in terms of technology and 
social media is a big thing. So my question is, how does your library utilize social media in your services? If we could maybe start with Marie. Yes. Um, so we use it quite heavily. Um, uh, in Denmark, we have a very high internet penetration. So of course it's a different story, but we also find that most of the communication online is done on social media. So we have um, platforms on Facebook, uh, Instagram. We do have a Twitter, which we don't use that much because Danish people are not very Twitter-ish. <laughs> um, um, but so what we do is we push uh, different content out. We push all our activities and, and events out on our social pa platforms. Uh, and we have been streaming on um, on Facebook during the lockdown. Um, this is going to continue and we see libraries joining forces also there uh, going together on screaming formats, streaming formats and not screaming formats. <laughs> uh, we could do that too. But um, yeah, so, so we do use social media quite heavily and we find it a very important way of um, reaching people. And I saw there was a question about uh, numbers and how many, um, how many do we reach when we stream, for instance, the partner, partner communication and partner conversation. And we see an enormous amount of people that we would never see in the library that looks through this over time. So it, the numbers keep rising. So something that would in doc one maybe attract, I don't know, 200, 300 people now gets around four to 5,000 uh, um, views or um, see-throughs on video on Facebook. So it does reach a different audience and it reaches more importantly, a different kinds of network that we have usually. So um, yeah, we use it quite heavily. And Harry, how do you feel about the relationship between the European platform and social media? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm a little bit ambivalent. I think uh, like Marie, we're, we're using it very heavily. Um, we, have a, we have a substantial outreach. We have 40,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, we're pretty strong still on Facebook. We started using Instagram now for a year and, and that really works for us in terms of outreach. Um, so one of the things that we're doing, uh, we've always done, is uh, make sure that when we use imagery, and we always use a lot of imagery that also takes, uh, gets you a lot more attention, uh, that we follow very strictly our own protocols. We're not just dumping an image on, uh, on Twitter. We make sure that only use, we only use the images that are uh, licensed appropriately for commercial use, uh, as well as non-commercial use. And the second thing we're doing is we're we're designing our campaigns very much uh, so that it's not it does, doesn't just end in the social space, but that we're trying to bring people back to our own platforms or other platforms like Wikimedia or a library or a museum, where we want people to also come to. So those are two little interventions that we're trying to do at the moment. Can I add one thing? Is that okay? Sure. Because I, I just want to share two ideas that I think can be replicated uh, everywhere. Um, one is that we use um, we have we use hashtag doc one um, that people can use in their Instagram, and when they do that, the images pops up on the screens in the library. So it's a way of getting people's own imagery and experiences at doc one to fill the library space. So it's a way of also getting pictures that we would never have the rights to use, but people showing what they've been doing in Doc One and wanting to show happy kids and nice food and stuff like that that we want to show. And the other thing is uh, using Instagram to show the people. So we have this, you, some of you might know on uh, Facebook, there is this called uh, Humans of New York, which is a wonderful um, story thread about people of New York. So we're doing it with uh, people or humans of Doc One or humans of this library or this library where we then over a period of time uh, take beautiful pictures of people and then have their little story to show the variety of people coming into the libraries and why they're coming in. So it becomes a, a big portrait gallery of the different images of people in our libraries. That is a, a very powerful tool as well. Thank you very much. And I think it's fascinating what you're saying echoes a little bit what Luke Swartout was saying last week from New York Public Library that social media can be this conduit towards the library but should not replace the library. Um, the, the next question we have is from Madia Reni. I just wanted to say I can see a couple of people putting their hands up. Can I recommend that actually if you have questions you use our questions and answers button? 
But over to you, Maria Rani. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Um, the first one is for Mary. Uh, how is your approach in upgrading digital skills to public librarians, especially with many different platforms that you offered? And the second one is for Harry. Uh, what is your opinion in defining values for cultural collection in physical, which uh, usually have higher values rather than digitized one? Thank you. Thank you. Marie, would you like to go first, given that the first question was for you? So, so basically, um, I believe that part of what a li library staff member should be able to is to actually use many different digital platforms. So it's part of our competence building. That doesn't mean that everybody um, write on our social media platform on our, on our websites, but what we've done is create um, uh, editor groups for our digi different digital platforms. So they, so we appointed specific people to look at these platforms and communicate together on how to push the right stories, how to work across all the different platforms that we're using and to have a more, you can say a more newspaper-like approach. And those are um, normal library staff that has just gone through competence building and, but more importantly, find this interesting and, and funny and something that they want to share. Um, so, so it's, we haven't, we haven't hired new people to do this. We've um, educated some more people to use this, but I basically think, think that all library staff should be able to do this. Thank you, and Harry? Yeah, um, um, let me see if I understood the question correctly. So I think the question was about value of physical versus online and how these two relate. Is that, uh, could, that, could that be a cool? So, I, don't, I think these two have separate values and they should complement each other. Uh, it reminds me of a little business model story uh, from the early days of eBooks. Uh, I was working in the academic publishing environment and NetBooks came up. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not even sure if that still exists, but let's assume it did. So we're such creatures of habit that uh, the business model that was negotiated between NetBooks and uh, the uh, the bigger libraries was one where if someone in the library took out a digital copy then no one else was able to then also read that digital copy because it was out on loan <laughs> and that is of course a, a direct replication from the physical environment which makes absolutely no sense in a digital environment so i really believe in you know I, i've got physical books over here I'm, I'm, i don't even have an e-reader uh, i love physical books but I think the digital gives us uh, a lot of different and new opportunities, uh, the storytelling and so forth, you know, reaching out, interacting. Um, so it's a very different value and I hope they complement each other uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Henry. Um, so um, the next question we'd like to, to, to pick up on is a question by uh, Jeff Riggs. And uh, Jeff Riggs, I'm just going to uh, give you the microphone for you to ask the question yourself. Um, I, I'm sorry, but I'm using my laptop. So I don't have a better microphone. But That's can you great. hear me? Yeah, we can hear can you very well. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, if you were to be assigned in a library where uh, there is a limited budget like our in like here in the Philippines uh, we have libraries that have a little or very limited budget so in order to be at par with the other libraries or in order for us to serve better with our um, users um, is it okay or is it normal to convert our printed materials into PDF once and to to share with it with them is it ethical? Do you find it very, is it okay? That's, that's what I mean. So how, how does uh, Denmark feel about it? Well, uh, yeah, like, basically I think in Denmark it's illegal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I, I wouldn't, um, so we, we would probably not go that in that direction, but I, um, because of the legislation and um, so, but what we would try to do is, and, and I, I recognize this is a very different situation from the Philippines. Um, we would try to make it available through the different learning systems that we have. 
but I realized that that cannot be replicated in all countries. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to comment on whether this is ethical, correct or not, because I think it's very much depends on the context that you're in in your library and in your library system. Yeah, I um, thank you for that. Henry, Harry, do you have anything to add on this or do you feel the same way? Uh, I think I'd say the same thing as Maria. I do recognize very much how difficult it is on a limited budget to also have an, an online presence. Uh, but digitizing on your by your on yourself would probably not be the thing I'd recommend. Um, but I think it's it's also then a you know uh, something that you might be able to explore is what is already available under license conditions that is available for you, and how can you make that available. Uh, worldwide. That would be a better approach, I think. Great, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm conscious this is <laughs> this is also quite a legal question at the moment with the case in the US against the Internet Archive. <laughs> so exactly, it is good to, yep, <laughs> we're waiting to see what happens there. Our next question is going to come from Ilya Argovenko. Um, so I have given you the floor, Ilya, and I think there's some interesting questions to be asked here about this evaluation of success. So Ilya, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that question that uh, I have only one vote. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think that, well, this campaign, uh, Who Can Draw Us the Best Ham, is not a very big success, actually. Uh, we could say that Instagram egg, as you remember, that has millions of views and likes, uh, is a huge success, but uh, actually it has just zero calories of value. And from this perspective, uh, maybe you could provide some examples of media campaigns that makes make us a real impact. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I guess that that's a question for me then. Yeah, to you, Harry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for making uh, yourself known. I was really curious about uh, about you. Um, and yeah, I think you you absolutely have a point. It's uh, it's it's very. You could say it's a flimsy campaign. It's uh, why hams and drawing hams. That's not. That's not a lot. That doesn't give us a lot of depth. I would. I would argue to you that there is value to it. Uh, if you think of this, this is an art academy. Uh, so inviting people uh, in to draw on their own and, and make that available on social media, I think, does have value. Um, but. It's definitely something to uh, to evaluate and weigh up on a case by case uh, situation. Now, of course, there are there are plenty of examples to give about you know uh, campaigns who have a bit more depth. Uh, if I may give you one of my own uh, of the European organization, we've done a, an extensive campaign on the theme of uh, World War One, where we've invited people to share their letters, their postcards, and so forth uh, from the First World War about 100 years ago, 10,000 people contributed to that. We have about, we collected about 200,000 letters and so forth, uh, which had both the human interaction that Marie is so focused on and rightfully so. So you, you bring people to share their story, unload that uh, to, to other people and make all those letters. So we have about 100,000 letters available, which are now being transcribed and we'll then be able to analyze, you know, what kind of patterns can we find in those letters from various sides of the trenches? So to me, that, that is something that has much deeper impact if you want than, you know, who can draw the best hand. But I, I wouldn't agree with you that it has no value. I hope that answers your question. You. And, and did you have any particular anything to add there, Marie, from the Aarhus experience? No, I think I'll do it with what Harry said. Okay, Gosha. All right, so we have um, some interesting questions on the value of libraries as democratic spaces. So what Marie talked about, and uh, maybe we could ask Nilay uh, to um, elaborate on her question. Hello, um, thank you for the chance and for the presentations. My question is, do you think digital communities are democratic and inclusive, inclusive enough? Or are some groups somehow excluded due to, for example, digital gap or some other reasons? 
And do you think libraries has the role and responsibility to reach all in their communities? Thank you. Thank you. So maybe we would start with Marie on that. Yes, and thank you for a great question. I think that's that you really hit the nail on the head because um, what we found when we were all in lockdown was that no, the digital communities are not democratic enough. And no, we do not reach all the people that we want to reach. So what we realized perhaps too late was that we do not have access and, and tools to actually reach some of the, the groups that might not be very involved in our, our joint community also in everyday life. So we spent quite a lot of time during these months of lockdown to um, discover new ways of reaching out to these groups. Uh, for instance, our homeless community were completely cut off uh, of everything during this um, the lockdown period. Um, so what we did immediately when we were allowed outside again was to try and reach out to some of the different organizations and parts of the municipality dealing with this particular group and figure out how we can create um, a stronger link to that uh, community in our society and how we could draw them into the library. Um, the same with the vulnerable young people and that uh, the lonely uh, young people sitting at home was also one of the groups that we found was underrepresented in our digital uh, communities that we are building up, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've done is now, and which is why I'm talking about these mixed um, formats, is to try and once we now out in the open again, try and draw them nearer to the library in order to build on their digital competences and also find other ways of reaching. I heard wonderful stories during the lockdown and also now, for instance, in New Zealand, where there they actually had the library staff phoning uh, all the uh, lonely, uh, not necessarily lonely, but elderly people uh, stuck at home, and to just to reach out and have a personal connection. So I think we shouldn't always be so focused on on digital or um, internet connection. Sometimes the phone works very well as well, and I think we um, we need to look at that also in communities where we don't have as high internet penetration. So I think we need to look at these different mixed formats and still maintain the necessity of having a, a physical space where we have these debate forums and have these opportunities to actually communicate with people who might think something else than we do. Um, so so it's, a, it's a very important and difficult thing. Wow, that's uh, like almost a great closing word, but I'm still very curious what Harry would have to well, say. I'm really looking at it only from the digital perspective. I do agree, Marie, that uh, you know having that mix is is, is the is the ultimate. Uh, I'm afraid we're, we'll still be in what in a variation of the lockdown for quite a while. Um, and maybe my let me share with you an example I, I had in real life last week. Is I've tried I wanted to give a presentation about what we do to my mother's book club. And my, mother's, my mother and her friends are in their 70s. They haven't been in the working environment as we are for a, well, five, 10 years, maybe. And to my great frustration, I wasn't able to get them on Zoom. I just wasn't. It was, you know, they, I found out they didn't have cameras. There was a shock to me. I mean, I'm so used to everyone having a camera. I, I felt shocked at my own ignorance there. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. I did find a solution, so we we invited a few people to join uh, via Zoom so we could have some interaction. And then we did what you're doing as well. We streamed it on, on, on YouTube so that it was super simple just to click on the link and they were able to, to see it. But it did tell me again, it's not something abstract. The digital divide is wide and deep. Thank you very much. <laughs> it, 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 it's true. I think this is this is obviously something we're going to be struggling with for some time, and we're going to have to get used to it one way or the other. So, what I want to do now is, as promised, is go back and try the poll again and see if people's views have changed on how effectively they think they can explain the relevant value or the the, the, the relative value of libraries um, now and of libraries in comparison with platforms. So, I'm just going to launch it. There we go. So the question is the same. Again, how confident do you feel in explaining the value of libraries in comparison with internet platforms such as YouTube or Amazon? And I'm just going to see if people are more or less optimistic than previously. 
Okay, we've already got 50 people voted. I'll give it another 10 seconds. There we go, 75 voted. Let's see if we can get up to 100. So five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to end the polling and share the results. Okay, this is an interesting result. Okay, we've now got joint uh, scores for people for seven and eight. So I think overall it's roughly the same. I think we have a few fewer pessimists in there. So I, I hope this means that, that Marie and her, Harry, you can go away feeling that you've done a really good job here. So I'm now going to hand back to Gosha. Yeah, thank you, uh, Stephen, for that. And thank you, Marie and Harry, for joining us today and for those fascinating presentations. Um, and thank you to all participants. This was the last of our webinar series from Emerging International Voices this year. And so if you are still interested in exploring this topic, um, please visit our website. I'm gonna post a link in the chat. We will have all the recordings of all three seminars there. And we will also have our Emerging International Voices, the 22 young librarians from all over the world um, discussing the results of this program. And we would of course love if you all joined the discussion with us and just stay tuned for what we are going to do next year as IFLA and the Goethe Institute on the topic. Thank you.